All right. First off, guys, thank you. Like, seriously, this is absolutely awesome to see a, a really good turnout. I asked a couple people before we got started, you know, what was the draw? What was the interest? What, what did it for you to say, this is where I want to spend the next hour? Free stuff. Okay, I've got a reputation for free stuff. That's always, that's always helpful. Anything else cause people to, uh, to show up? The other ones are, okay, okay, that's the second, you know, the, the least sucky of the sessions. That's, no, I'm not, I'm not I, I don't even know who else is, uh, is speaking right now, but I, I do mean sincerely, thank you guys very much for, for coming out. This is, this is truly, go ahead. Am I done? I'm sorry. No, no, you're, you're, you're held captive. Can we lock the door, please, to keep everyone inside the room until, uh, until the end? No, this is, this is seriously one of, one of my favorite times of the year. I love Bry Forum. I love how it's just an open exchange where you can pretty much say anything and not get in trouble. Um, it allows me to, you know, to check the vendor badge at the door. Um, even though I love my employer and I love my job and I love my former boss that's in the front row, um, all of that goes uh, you know, together to say this is a really great time. So I hope you, you're able to enjoy the show and, and learn something a little bit along the way. Um, just to, to let you all know, um, I, safe to say nobody attended my session in London, at Bry Forum London? Okay, whew, because what I, the way I like to describe it is you are going to see content as fresh as a Pizza Hut salad bar, right? You, you know how Pizza Hut does this? Once or twice a day, they'll go through and they'll sprinkle just a little bit of fresh lettuce on top of the same wilted green stuff that had been there all day. And, uh, you know, just stir up the dressing so that you can't tell that it's got a scum um, forming on top. I've gone through and I have done a, a fair number of updates, but, you know, there, there is a fair bit of uh, repeat with, uh, with what was presented in London. So just to give you guys a, a, a quick introduction to, to who I am and, and where this is coming from, um, David Stafford, born and raised in, in Bay City, Michigan. Um, Bay City is that town just north of Detroit really famous for, uh, for fireworks. Um, I grew up somewhere between a cornfield and uh, in the woods. Um, the, the hippest restaurant in town is a restaurant called Mr. Hot Dog. And uh, that's where you know that you uh, are, are taking your girlfriend out on a special date. Um, the second thing is to tell people that I'm, I'm actually older than 19. Um, I use 19 because that's how long I've, I've actually been in this industry. So if you don't believe that I've been doing this, um, I started out at a company up in mid-Michigan called Dow Corning, and that's what I was doing when I was 19 years old. Um, I was a, a co-op in the computer team. I was the only kid in high school that got to carry a pager, and uh, believe me, I used that to my advantage where I would literally page myself out of class uh, to be able to, to run off. Yeah, you know... <laughs> Didn't exactly get held back. And you look 13. Yeah. No, I, I, I did graduate on time. And I've spent way more time under the desk fixing computers than I actually have, you know, up in front speaking and, uh, and uh, being on the vendor side. So really, really love my job. After Dow Corning, I went to work for a really big company. Um, I thought managing 10,000 seats was really cool. So, you know, what's cool is not 10,000. It's managing 100,000. Um, not at that Cisco, but at this Cisco. And that gave me a chance to, to try my hand at different things. So I went all the way from Michigan. I tried out the cost of living in the Bay Area. They told me it wasn't that expensive and that I'd be able to figure out a way to make it work. As you can tell, it didn't go quite as planned. And so now I live happily in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I... Uh, I now get to be a full-time telecommuter. So being a full-time telecommuter has given me the chance to work at VMware, get to do lots of fun, cool, interesting things like dance on top of rental cars and uh, you know, pitch the, the, uh, the, the product of the day. Had a lot of fun doing the, the View 5 launch video. That's me wearing a, a Sean Bass bright green shirt um, directly on top of the car. Anybody here on Twitter? Don't, don't be ashamed. Yes, yes. There are a few people here on Twitter. So, um, 
friends back at, uh, at corporate did send me with a little something. I don't think there's necessarily one for everybody, but if you happen in the time during the session, if you're having a good time, or if you need a little bit of persuasion, you see those yellow sheets in front of you? Um, feel free to follow me, or just maybe put a comment out there that you're really having a great time during the session, and we'll, uh, we'll at least take the top 20 or so that, uh, that come in, and uh, come up and you can pick up, courtesy of the guys out in Palo Alto, uh, a free copy of either Workstation or Fusion, so that you can, uh, you know, can't say that you didn't get anything out of the session. Um, I, I had to fly to Palo Alto, but I've actually brought them beautiful Chicago, and you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hand out everything I've got. And so again, you know, and, and I also like how it's VMware Fusion 5, as in if you need a hint on rating a session, five. Um, you know, I'm, I'm shameless. It's the only way I get to come back next year is if you guys you know, tell, uh, tell the folks that you had a good time today. Um, if you can include the VMW works, underscore workstation or VMware Fusion in the tweet, let the guys know that you enjoyed your, uh, your, your free tchotchke. So, all I can say, and you've heard me say it before if you've ever had me present or, or talk, is I love end user computing. And I love it so much that if this is end user computing, this is how much I love end user computing. So hopefully we've loosened it up and we've proven that, uh, that I, I checked my badge because you can't hold my employer responsible. What I wanted to do is give people a little bit of a retrospective on how our IT careers have gotten to this point, and more importantly, what can we be doing today in order to make our IT careers fulfilling going forward, and what are some of the, the ways that we can avoid flying off the edge of the cliff as we make some of these transitions? Because we've gone through these things before, and what I hope is that we can take a look back and understand how we've gotten to where we are today, and how are some of the things that are happening today relevant in terms of keeping our careers moving forward. So this is kind of what inspired me for this session. Um, some of you might have read this Jack Madden's article that talked about the difference between consumer capabilities and IT capabilities is what led to my favorite topic of, of FUIT. And here it is summed up beautifully in a, in a very simple graph. Once upon a time, IT presented technology that was superior to anything that you could get in the consumer world, and so people, really, they really liked us. Like IT, we were the good guys not too long ago. But as our consumer lives started to outpace the capabilities that IT were providing, that's where FUIT was, was really born. And so I went out and I surveyed a, a decent sample, right? I was able to get just 25 people that were IT pros from all different parts of the, you know, what have I got, four continents and four decades of IT represented to tell me how they've managed their IT career and how they've, they've watched some of these things progress. And so I've collected some data to, to help articulate IT in, uh, in the new world. So I started with this idea of technical proficiency. And the, what I was asking people is to tell me a little bit about how you viewed yourself as an IT pro, and how did your users view the role of IT um, in terms of what their knowledge and their capabilities were? And so as we look past over the last 20 years, basically what's happened is once upon a time, IT, we were the gurus. And the users recognized that, you know what, hey, IT is just here to help me use technology and, and equip me to do my jobs better. And, and what that was is what I called the chasm of respect in a good way. This is when IT actually earned the respect of our users because we were helping to help fulfill what they needed in order to be productive in the business. And what we've had happen over years and years is that chasm is just closed to where I feel today that IT is not given near the, the respect we deserve. IT is oftentimes viewed as a hindrance. We are dragging down the speed of business. We're not providing the agility. We're not giving them that new you know, iPad mini. Whatever it is, IT isn't being respected as what we're doing to enable the business. And there's things that we can do to help change that and to help you know, turn that frown upside down. 
if we go back to when things for me began, pretty much in my IT career, this is what users said, and that was, I love IT. You know, I, we all hear the jokes where, you know, how do I use this foot pedal that we gave them when we took them off of the tiger screens and the, force, you know, the mainframe terminals? So while users were off learning how to use a, a new GUI interface, what was the, what was the core IT skill that, that we all had to do back then? It was effectively building and configuring hardware and installing Windows. That was, that was my core IT skill set at the very beginning of my career, was being able to install Windows on a PC and get it up and working. Now, Windows 95 came out. We all remember the people storming the Best Buy store to get their copy of Windows 95, you know, just like they did with Vista. And, you know, America Online, right? I'm online, baby. That was people getting onto the internet. Well, IT, we'd moved beyond just, you know, installing by floppy disks, and we started to look at things like automated deployments. And how, did we, how could we start to scale and make more efficient our IT skills like installing an OS? I put this book up here. This is a, this is a, a favorite book of mine. When I interviewed in Cisco IT, I was asked what my number one technical skill was. And this was in 2000, and I, you know, I answered that question so fast, I said, the automated deployment of operating systems and applications. Booyah, take that. And the guy sitting across the table from me, he said, oh, he said, uh, have you ever read the book, um, Automated Deployment of you know, NT Workstation? No, no, I, I can't say I've ever read that one. Well, the only thing I could have said worse would have been, yeah, I read it, it sucked. Um, because Richard Puckett, the author of Automated Deployment of Operating Systems, was the guy sitting across the table from me interviewing me. It's kind of a humbling experience, you know, to, to, uh, to find out that, you know, the, the author on the subject is who, uh, is who's grilling me. But that's okay. Um, I got the job. That was all that mattered. And so now, let's figure out what we're going to do to make people more productive. And I remember this story, right? If I promise that you'll get some more work out of me and I'll work from home, will you buy me a laptop? Right? The laptop was like the badge of coolness. I'm important. I got a laptop. You know, we, we even had people overseas where, you know, it, it, it showed a, a, a status, you know, in, in country of, of how, you know, how, uh, how eligible you were for marriage if you had a laptop or not. Um, you know, true, true stories. So, okay, we've got this user demand now saying, buy me a laptop, I'll work from home. What we're trying to figure out is how not to deploy Wintendo, right, Win98. Um, and if you did, I'm sorry, you know, that was where I got my first experience installing Metaframe, was because we had Windows 98 and I had to find a way to make SAP GUI work because SAP GUI exhausted the GDI heap of Windows 98. It was never designed for, uh, for, for 9X, and that was what got me experience deploying the, uh, Metaframe was, was being able to overcome that. Happened again. Now users are coming to IT asking for advice, but this time it's, hey, Dave, you're in IT. Can you tell me how to do port forwarding? I just bought a Linksys. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you can give me some pointers because I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, net meeting to work so that I can do video chat. And, you know, okay, maybe IT still had a little bit of relevance, we were needing to move forward as well. One of the biggest, I think, you know, IT transitions that we've had to manage in our careers, remember going from Novell to, uh, to NT and NT to Active Directory? What a learning curve that was, right? Unless you came from NDS, going to Active Directory, X.500, uh, LDAP, um, what? Radical, radical change that we had to, uh, that we had to manage that was really one of those times where we had to go and, and hit the books and skill up. And, you know, looking at some of the things that are happening today, it's, it's happening all over again. Today is one of those times where we're, we're going to need to go and, and skill up again. And my good friend um, Richard Puckett and Robbie Allen, they actually wrote a book on managing Active Directory, and, and so that was the first book I ever got uh, an acknowledgement in. So the guy that uh, originally grilled me in the interview 
came back and, and gave me a, a, a nice call out in the book. O2, laptops, this is for everybody now. This is just a given, right? It's not welcome to the company, here's your desktop. It's, it's we're gonna give everyone a laptop. That's all good and great. And in order to do that, now we need to make that VPN pervasive and start to look at how we can open up remote access. Think of the corollary here, right? Today we're sitting here trying to figure out how to extend mobile reach and mobile access for mobile devices to any device. We've done this once before, sort of. Um, there's, there's a lot of lessons that we can draw from in, in helping to manage through the, the mobility thrust that's upon us today. The user's perspective, you know, prior to FUIT, it was, it was a little bit more mild, right? It was just, you annoy me, IT. Started with those little prompts, you know, it's time to install an update. Okay. No, it's really time to install an update, and I'm gonna reboot your computer in 11 minutes, and many times not give you an opportunity to postpone. Okay, fine, I give in, I'll accept the update. And then we all love that screen, right? As we're shutting down the computer, please wait, you know, installing update one of three. No, you can't go home yet. Yes, I know you're late to pick up the kids from daycare. And what was happening in the IT world? Who remembers this screen? Anybody? What was it? Anybody? Blaster, well done. Well done, Blaster, MyDoom, Nachia, they were all the, uh, the IPC, RPC exploits, right? And so as IT professionals, we, were, we went running off and we wrote WMI scanners um, to be able to remotely connect out and discover where machines were, were infected and being able to um, handle it because it was, a, it was a randomly named executable with a statically named DLL, so you got to do associators of and walk the entire process tree and find out where the random DLL was hooked. Um, yeah, those, those, were, those were good times. So mobility came upon us, and people started falling into Blackberry prayer, right? So hopefully anybody that's doing that in this session is posting on Twitter and following me, because they want a freebie. Um, and Cyber Monday, right? Where did Cyber Monday come from? Black Friday, because the internet connection at work was faster than the internet connection at home. So the whole idea was that if you came in on Monday, you got to use the really fast computers and the fast internet connection at work to do all your Christmas shopping because you were still on dial-up at home, right? That was only seven years ago. So all of that was, was now upon us, and we're trying to do content filtering, blocking out Amazon.com and blocking out eBay so that people can't go and, and you know, use those work assets for personal life. But think about what we're talking about now when we talk about mobile application management, right? We're always talking about personas and dual personas and switching between work and personal and keeping the two, you know, carefully separated. Something that we've maybe done once before, just in a, in a different context. And users started coming back and saying, you know, buy me a new phone, I don't like this one, or, I don't want to use your on-premise web conferencing because WebEx is way better or, or, or GoToMeeting, insert your favorites. And at the same time, we're like, you know, never mind Vista, we're, we'll move beyond that, but we need iPhones for evaluation purposes. How many people got an iPhone under the uh, guise of, raise them high and proud. <laughs> IT guys rock, right? It's for evaluation. I need to test the iPhone and, uh, and, and, and see how that works. And because of all of the testing that we need to devote to the iPhone, you know, I'm not actually going to be able to address this whole SaaS application thing that's upon us. Um, when, I, when I was in IT at Cisco, one of the, one of the coolest names of a program, the, the program for, remember what SaaS was before it was called SaaS? It was called ASPs, right? application service providers. So we actually instituted a program to go and hunt out all of the SaaS applications, and the name of the program was called Aspirin. So it was to go out and, and seek out all of those programs to try and get them under IT control and under IT management. And now we're, we're literally coming up to present day, you know, not only do I want you to let me pick out my phone, but I also, now I want to use a Mac, 
and I'd like an iPad, and, you know, IT to the rescue. How many of you guys also pulled off getting your companies to buy you an iPad? Perfect. Well justified. Right? And, and I love Bri Brian called it out in the keynote this morning. Right? The, the iPad with VDI is how we were able to justify the purchase of the iPad, was because, hey, look, it's Windows on an iPad. And finally, users gave up, right? And now we've moved well beyond annoy, you annoy me IT into full out FU IT. And, you know, in the meantime, what are we left to need to skill up on, right? SAML, OAuth, MDM, MAM, MIM, consumerization of IT, what the heck, right? And uh, I'm, I'm getting another year's use out of this graphic because I paid $15 to use it in a public presentation last year from like stockphoto.com. So I'm gonna keep using that picture as long as I can to get my 15 bucks worth. So now we go and we overlay that across the, the, the pace of history and, and how we got to where we are today. And we can see all these different milestones of, of where we've come from. And every one of these steps has now kind of brought us to, you know, what, what have we learned? So what are some of the warning signs that your career might be coming, you know, jeopardized? I don't know about you, I love my job. I love this space, I love this industry. The last thing I want to do is become obsolete or irrelevant just because I wasn't able to keep pace. I mean, I used to be very, very hard on management and project managers because effectively I'm like, oh, I get it. You, you know, when, when you can't keep your skills sharp, you become, you become a manager. That's, that's kind of like, the, the, to me that was always the sign of I give up, is yeah, I'm gonna let you, know, you, you young punks take care of the technology. I'm going to move into program management or, or project management to, uh, to do that. That was one of the triggers why I, I felt like I needed to switch industries, is working in a chemical manufacturing company, IT wasn't a core part of the business, but working in an IT sector um, has certainly been more rewarding. So, warning sign number one. When you wake up and realize Bill Gates didn't actually sign your MCSE certificate, that's one of the first warning signs that your career might be in trouble. You know, we, we've all had these certificates hanging on our, our cube walls at one point to, to make sure everybody knows how superior we are in terms of our technical skills. That was one of the first wake-up calls that I, I realized is, uh, shucks, that signature looks exactly the same on my neighbor's cube than, uh, than it does mine. Another thing to watch out for, take a look at the role that you want and the role that you just came from. Because one of the first things that I see happening is when that whole outsourcing or core versus context discussion starts coming up in business, it's usually relief that the role that you just came from might be the one that's being targeted and that you've been promoted into some higher order position. But it's one of those things where you, you all remember, you know, the, the Looney Tunes where, you know, you're running off the cliff as it's eroding and you're just trying to stay on, on solid ground. Keep an eye out for what's happening to those two roles because when you start moving from core versus context or you start seeing terms like legacy or sustaining or optimization within team names, um, those, are, those are some of the warning signs that says that you might not be that safe for that much longer. Another one is around authoring statements of work. Uh, that's one of the things I always find very, very interesting for, for IT professionals is you know what, we've decided that we're going to take this out for, for bid instead of actually building the expertise in-house. We'd like you to help build a statement of work. For an IT pro, this isn't our core you know, skill set, writing legal documents and statements of work and milestones and payment milestones. But when you're asked to help contribute to, uh, to outlining the statement of work, that, that sometimes isn't a necessarily a good thing. And then the other one is we're gonna focus on shadow IT. We're gonna, we're gonna start to find it wherever it lives in the organization because shadow IT is, is you know, undermining our investment in core IT services. And this one happened to me uh, as well where we had a CIO talk up, you know, we are going to root out shadow IT wherever it lives in the organization. And what did we do the very next you know, day, year? We start celebrating 
some of these shadow IT programs and projects that delivered massive business to the value, or I'm sorry, massive value to the business. Um, that is just kind of you know, uh, disheartening to an IT guy where you're trying to provide a service, you're trying to get investment to come in, the CIO says that we're going to get rid of it, but instead when you know, users actually achieve something without your help, they get put up in the company meeting as an exhibit of, of how great we are at innovation. That's usually the badge that it gets, it, it gets tagged with. So let's take a look around the corner and, and see what's coming next in terms of things that we need to do. So one of the first things, and this came up in a lot of my survey responses as well, is learn how to evolve your sources of knowledge. So let's take a look at you know, what, what once was and what is. One of the questions I said is, where did you used to go for technical information, and, and where are you going now to learn about these new technologies? My very first day in IT was that box of Microsoft Office Suite version 4.2, contained Microsoft Word 6.0, Excel 5.0, and PowerPoint 4. Technically, I think it was like PowerPoint version 2, but they just gave it a version bump. My job was to take those boxes of manuals and distribute them to each one of the buildings and departments so that it would be in like the local library that if you needed to go and look up how to use a feature, you knew it was usually next to the printer that you could go and pull the manual to learn how to, uh, how to use the product. And then we started to go to expert books, you know, books like this one written by uh, Brian Madden and Ron Oglesby. Um, expert books. It was the highlight of my, my, my month that we got to go to Barnes & Noble and pick out a tech book and expense it back to the department in order to learn the latest, uh, the latest technologies. Anybody remember those binders? It's kind of a sad day that we just heard that like TechNet's going away, the IT Pro uh, software subscriptions. Don't you remember how excited you were when those envelopes came in the mail? <laughs> yes? They were everywhere. So, so what you did is you took out the new, the new month CD and you dropped it in. And if you're like me, we, what we actually did is we went in and we read all the new articles for the month, right? Because you felt like you, you, you could just at least keep up with all the new information that was coming in. And, I read every NT article, I read every WINS article, I read every DHCP server article. And you know, that was in, installed every beta that, uh, that came, but that required TechNet Plus. Um, and then we read the online KBs. Q articles, I got corrected when I called it the, the KB article back in the day, but no, they were Q articles. And so now we turn to going online to those knowledge bases and suddenly putting in the CD wasn't that important because the online stuff was always a little bit fresher and easier. Then we went to expert forums. How frustrating was this? You type in the search for what you're looking for into Google, you hit enter, and it's behind a paywall that you have to subscribe to an expert forum in order to get the legitimate answer on what it is that you were trying to, uh, to learn how to do. Yes, anybody? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know if, I, I never paid for it. Did they actually have the answer? Or did they just really put, it did. Because I was too cheap to ever pay for it. I just thought that these guys came up with the really like obvious questions and like did AdWord sponsorship for like, why is my computer slow? Ah, uh, okay. Perfect, perfect. I was, uh, I, was, I was a little bit, you know, impatient, I guess. And now we've gone to this new world of, it's no longer subscribing to expert forums where you, you had to pay, but now we're all part of a community. And that's effectively you know, why, why I love you know, this, this group, this forum, this, this room that we're in right now, where now this information is just openly exchanged freely among like-minded pros that, that just want to help each other out and, and move, move everyone together at once. So evolving our sources of knowledge is certainly one of the best ways that we can, we can continue to stay abreast of all the latest and, and greatest. So much of what we do is still related to the operating systems on these devices. You know, Kevin, Kevin Goodman and, and Randy Cook were, were talking about how, you know, it wasn't that long ago that it was the, the, the demise of Windows was predicted and, 
and uh, yet here we are 20 years later and, and Windows still seems to be pretty much active. You know, we started out where it was putting in floppy disks, right? I think NT was 35 floppy disks or something like that to do NT. And um, the reason I bought my first CD-ROM was because I got a copy of the Chicago beta of Windows 95 and it came on a CD and I didn't have a CD-ROM. So I actually had to go out to buy it just to play with Windows 95. So it shipped on CD. And then we started ghosting all of our machines, right? Even though that technically wasn't allowed or supported until SysPrep came along. And that brought in you know, automated OS deployment. This is where I actually found where things got interesting. This all seemed pretty normal. Look at how the iPhone works. One of the things that I find really interesting about the iPhone is it starts to su subscribe to an OS image management model akin to every other electronics device that we use. What happens if your cable modem freezes and you have to call the cable company and, and ask them why my internet doesn't work? What's their troubleshooting step? Unplug it, wave it around your head for 30 seconds, plug it back in. Um, I always joked about that, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? The wait 30 seconds thing? I used to think it was total BS, but the, there's actually like two legitimate reasons for it. One is MAC address locking that they'll only allow a single device on, and then the second thing is they're just waiting for capacitors um, to be able to draw out so that you know, they, they can obviously handle brownouts. And that bought you the 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. The, the iPhone introduced a firmware model of management for operating systems, and this is why I found it so, so interesting. We went from this old school way of installing Windows through various automated means to where now our new management model for operating systems is to unplug it, wait 30 seconds, and plug it back in, or press and hold the reset button for 10 seconds. And that's what I find really interesting, because not only do we see that now on devices like, like the iPhone, but there it is on a Mac through the, through the uh, EFI, being able to actually download the operating system directly from Apple to be able to restore the system from bare metal, which really was appealing. And in fact, it's one of the technologies, and this is in no way a vendor plug so I don't break any rules, but one of the really interesting technologies that actually surfaced in, uh, in the Wanova product, uh, which is now VMware Mirage, is it actually has this idea of, it's, it's almost like torrent style distribution, where it's actually exchanging blocks peer to peer when it does image updates, you know, represented by kind of this, this grid model. Because if you think about it, if we're all running Windows, isn't it silly that we would all need to go out to Microsoft or to Apple or anybody else to download the blocks for Windows, when on this local area network right here, all of those blocks have already been downloaded and are already present? So it makes for very, very efficient distribution means. And it's one of my favorite features. It's called branch reflector in the product. It starts to take advantage of the fact that there's no point in delivering redundant data over a network wire, but you can actually just use you know, peer-to-peer -peer distribution in order to get that. So I think that it's very, very you know, telling that we're not going to be in the world of ghost imaging much longer. We're going to be moving more to this firmware style of management with very intelligent network topologies in order to handle distribution. So that's great for the operating system. Let's take a look at what's happening in the application landscape. Now, I love this slide that, that called out kind of the middle of 2011 as the tipping point around Windows applications. And this is where people can get the wrong, the wrong idea, and they're going to think like, oh, this is where he tells us that, you know, Windows is dead, when what I'm saying is kind of quite the opposite. It's, we are now in the long tail of Windows. They're going to be around for a long, long time. Credit to Brian, cockroaches, Twinkies, Windows applications when Armageddon comes. Um, that's effectively the world that we're living in now, is how are we going to make sure that we can sustain Windows for a long, long time going forward, and what's happening in terms of the, the trends around applications? So let's throw those across kind of the, the timeline. 
Once upon a time, we had native applications, but they were native terminal applications. And they were effective. And next, we saw a native take it to a new world, which was you know, native local applications that only ran on that one device. Native client server applications, right? We took all of our Rex programmers, we sent them off to Visual Basic School, they learned how to do a select all statement against a database, drop the results into a grid control. You're laughing? Too true? Been there? Done it? <laughs> kind of? Right? You did a select all statement, you drop the results into a grid control so that you could sort by clicking on the column title instead of hitting an F14 key, you know, up on the top row of the mainframe. And, you know, that, that gave rise to the, uh, you know, the, the client server applications. Then came you know, how do we transition to this, this web world? And that, that gave rise to ActiveX, you know, that, that almost a web app uh, concept. And then web was able to uh, evolve to be slightly more dynamic, and, and we got into Ajax. Now things are feeling pretty good, except we want a more native-like experience, so we start seeing HTML5. That's just to see if Dan Shapiro's awake and listening. Hey, Dan. I swear Dan like, has this like, internal filter on Twitter where anywhere in the world where HTML5 ever gets mentioned, like, Dan just immediately like, knows about the whole dialogue and the discussion and, and always has um, some really great insights to offer whenever, whenever that word's said. So that was my, my Dan Shapiro trigger. Um, how, how we start to take advantage of back-end web services, which gave rise to native clients back-ended by web services. So I love this whole progression of, of applications where we're now able to take advantage of local modalities and, and local interfaces with, with uh, a web service backend so that you can take advantage of whatever the hardware is. And, and that takes us really to what I think the future of all applications will be. <laughs> or maybe not. Um, you know, I, I guess with, uh, with the start button coming back, we, we might not need to worry about that so much, so much any longer. So if that's kind of the trends around OS um, and applications, what happens to us in terms of managing it in the enterprise? Let's do it men in black style. Uh, let's talk about the old and busted. Um, old and busted methods, none of us are doing this anymore, right? No longer are we doing the sneaker net. No longer is it login script-based distribution and PC anywhere to remote control somebody and, and expecting everyone in the company to have you know, any color as long as it's black, specifically a ThinkPad or a BlackBerry. Um, you know, it's all about the new hotness. And now we're controlling things by group policies. Anything that is difficult to manage, we do using either RDSH or VDI in order to deliver those. On our mobile space, we're open now, we can do it with MDM, we can do it with MAM, we can do it uh, focused on the, on the content with MIM. And one of my favorite areas of, of exploration right now, I love the concept of data containers, because I think that it starts to put what's important first, instead of just talking about managing the, you know, the, the applications around it, but really just zeroing in on how we can protect the data as, uh, as going forward. And that reminds me of my interview when, uh, when I joined VMware. Because when I joined VMware, you know, we've all heard this. And I'm so sick of this lead-in, and I, I, I rant about it on Twitter. It's all about the, um, once upon a time, it was all about managing the device, right? We, we talked about that already. It used to be about how we installed operating systems and built PCs, and it was all about the actual devices. We were wrong, it's all about the users, and we need to be more user-centric, and we need to make sure that all of our focus is on delivering what, uh, what services are needed to the user. And then my favorite one was, my interview question is, David, we're so glad you get it. It's all about the applications, it's not just about the device, it's not just about the, it's all about the apps. And I smiled and nodded, yeah, yeah, it's all about the apps, but I didn't believe a word of it, because, what I really think it's all about when it comes to managing through this transition is it's all about the content. And I don't just say the data because think about it, right? The world doesn't live in document files anymore. So much of our data is part and parcel with the applications 
and the services that we interact with, that it's not just about protecting our Word documents. Um, that's probably not the source of, of uh, key information. You know, once upon a time, this, the world was a lot simpler. You, you stored all of your data out on the files, file shares. You remember, how we, remember how we sold this to our users? Right? It's backed up. What, did the user, what, 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 would, what would a user say today if we told them it's backed up? They'll just laugh at you and point at their time machine or their time capsule backup that, yeah, it's OK. I got the backups covered, dude. It's, it's, uh, it's not that critical. Or file sharing meant putting it out on the public drive. How many people still have public drives? Wow. Old school, I love it. That's, uh, that, 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 that was always the way that, that we just seemed to do it. And, and we had to put scripts in place that would purge it after seven days, right, to, uh, to clear it out. Um, I've always picked on, on, on my good friend Dan Brinkman, representing uh, ShareFile, that I want to do a bake-off someday between all these different enterprise Dropbox clients out there and, and Robocopy slash Mer, just to see if, uh, if data sync and share is, is really that much different um, today. And collaboration meant emailing it around or posting it to a SharePoint. But today, data just wants to be free, right? Data wants to get out any way that you can possibly think of, whether it's, you know, files. It's not, it's not in the file. What, what is the file type of, of uh, Evernote? Um, you know, Evernote doesn't have a file type. It's just it's it's inherent in the uh, in the content, or you know insert enterpri enterprise Dropbox here or collaboration via something like a Socialcast or a Podio or Pulse. That's where where content is is starting to evolve to, and what we need to protect, because instead of us putting it just in the data center up in a file repository, or even allowing it to go to a consumer service and just syncing it to the cloud or allowing the enterprise keys to get put on the system. My favorite example of this is, is this whole you know, Evernote paradox that we're facing today. And when we look at the Evernote problem, it, it manifests itself so nicely and so cleanly because we go and we allow some sort of a bring your own program and users, you know, what was it? it was, Two years ago, in that basement of the Hilton, where Brian, in his keynote, stood up on a chair and he said, it's not bring your own computer, it's bring your own Mac. We'll just call it what it is. Um, that was one of the things that really you know, brought us into this, was OneNote doesn't work on my Mac. That's what IT provides. So if IT isn't going to provide me what I need, I'll go and find something that does. Evernote works on my Mac. That's a much better way for me to be able to handle all my notes because not only is it there, it's free and I can sync it with my phone and I can get at it from the web. And, you know, I'm using it. How many people here use Evernote? Hands up, Let's keep them up, keep them up. How many are allowed to be using Evernote under corporate IT policies? No idea, no idea. don't know, yes, yes, it's fully allowed. What I cho choose not to ask. This is one of those things where, you know, it's fascinating to hear, yes, we, we block Evernote, or we block Dropbox, or we put IT policies and controls, you know, to keep people from doing that, when the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, people are going to do it. And this, is, this was the point that I made um, back in London that actually triggered Brian to, to write a, a, a whole article dedicated to this point. And the way that he, he, he summed it up was this one sentence that I said kind of off the cuff. And I said, we used to always worry about data leakage. And it used to be so concerned about how do we make sure that none of our data ever leaves our enterprise and we always have security policies and controls around it. And what I want to put forth to think about is that I believe that all knowledge worker content today is created outside of IT policies and controls. And it's no longer worried about the data leakage side. It's what can we do to convince users to bring their data back into the enterprise? So let's, I mean, just think about all the different places that knowledge work or knowledge data is created. I'm not talking about, you know, the customer order guy that's typing it into a, you know, a Java app and hitting submit, you know, in a call center, but 
when you're talking about knowledge work or engineering work, you know, it, it starts with two people collaborating or talking in a room or in front of a whiteboard. And what do you do when you get done using the whiteboard before you have to leave the room? Picture. Take a picture. Where does the picture go? Personal folder, iCloud, you know, immediately, boom. How do you share it? Text messaging, email. So, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's the wrong analogy. Anybody here exchange business cards while you've been here so far? Yes? What are you gonna do with that business card? You're gonna scan it in, and you're gonna put it directly into the corporate email system that doesn't sync to any of your devices? Or take a picture of it, or type that guy's email address into your cell phone contact list? Again, all I'm trying to say is I believe that all knowledge work and all knowledge data is created outside of the enterprise boundary. So don't focus strictly on how are we going to keep this all in because you don't have anything to keep in when it comes to this new knowledge work that's starting to, to evolve. How are you going to convince people to give you, the enterprise, keys to the personal content that they're creating? And, you know, I, I had a, a long discussion. The guy that runs, uh, you know, the Cisco IT mobility program, effectively the, the similar role to what I had when I was there, I, I'll throw it out there, right? You know, whoops. One of the things that it used to be was, was just trying to get it back into our repositories, our documentums or our, our shares or those types of things, but I really believe that collaboration might be one of the key hooks, is if, if in order for me to make it more effective to collaborate with other people uh, means that I need to put it into an enterprise system, that would be a really good reason for me to upload my data or to turn it over to my enterprises because that allows me to interface with a broader network of, of peers inside my organization. So I think collaboration might be one of the carrots um, that we can use to help draw that information back into the enterprise. But, you know, I'm, I'm always open and anxious to hear you guys, you know, educate me on what other carrots you see that we could use to try to get more of this information back to the enterprise than, than to be floating around, you know, just in, in the ether. If any great ideas come up, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all ears. Now, identity management, we, we understood this, right? It used to be about domains and trusts, and we used to migrate people to Active Directory. That's not quite the core of identity management anymore today. So if you consider yourself to be really, really you know, skilled on adding users to Active Directory and managing the forest and the trust relationships between BUs and, and acquisitions, make sure that you're at least up on Identity feder Federation, you know, via the likes of a SAML um, method. Because if you're not familiar with SAML, here's the, the, the sub-100 level. SAML isn't about taking your username and your password and putting it in a secure hash and shipping it over the internet so that somebody else can crack it open and read your password. The whole principle of SAML is around the concept of assertions. And it's effectively saying that, yes, I assert that this person is who he says it, he is and he's entitled to be able to use that external application. And I've got lots of personal stories of, of why SAML is a better way to tie all of that authentication back. Now, SAML as, a, as an open standard is certainly something that is valuable. The other thing is to start to put things more contextual around identity. And this was actually right out of um, a, a session that I did at Cisco Live. It isn't just who you are when we talk about identity, because you can actually start to create multi-factored identity, and I don't mean multi-factor as in a token fob keychain that you have to carry with you everywhere. You can start to create these various rings of trust simply by assembling, you know, four points of, of data. Who you are, that could be your username and your password or your single sign-on token. What application it is that you're trying to access. So the example here is if it's the company directory, probably would have a lower level of security than pre-release financial data. You probably would need to assert maybe something in terms of a certificate or what device you're coming in on 
in order to access pre-release financial data to really make sure that the, the endpoint is secure. All four of these really start to function as a mix and match puzzle of how you can create multi-factor identity services well beyond just username and password and deliver those seamlessly where it's actually easier and simpler on your users than requiring them to, to put in a, my, my, you know, Chuck and I, we were just lamenting. We used to have this really effective application that we used all the time for, for internal social collaboration, but now we have to put a two-factor authentication pin in in order to get into it daily or, or weekly at, at best. And guess what? Our use of that application has gone to zero because it's just too much of a pain in the butt to need to go and put two-factor pin in just in order to get into our, our, you know, an enterprise Facebook. So the second thing is certificates. Now, some might think that, oh my gosh, what, what decade is this? He's telling us that we need to learn about certificates? Um, all I can tell you is, if you ever go and you ever release a product that went from not requiring signed certificates to requiring signed certificates, and you take a look at the help desk and the, you know, the support phone calls that suddenly come in with people going, how the heck do you sign a certificate? Um, you'll quickly realize that this isn't baseline knowledge yet. This is still something that, that isn't there, right? When we start talking about things like a PKI or a CRL, who knows what a CRL is? Certificate revocation list. For what it's worth, that was about a third to half the hands. Maybe half of you are, are tired. But get comfortable around the concept of, of certificates. And I'm not telling you that you need to go become a, a, a PKI master and that you need to you know, be VeriSign cer certified or anything like that. But to understand all of the different elements of a, of a PKI infrastructure and how these function together is really going to start to pay off because you know, it, it was somewhat surprising to see how much of a gap there is today in the industry around knowledge of this space. Now, once upon a time, right, back, let's talk about that move from Nintendo over to NT. One of the very fundamental changes between, you know, 9X and FAT and NT and NTFS was security. Right? Suddenly there was file level security and there was user level security around session management. That never existed before in the 9X days. We managed to, to adapt to that. Once upon a time, that was all that we ever needed to know about security was how, how we, we applied a, a file level security or how we went into the advanced tab on, on uh, file permissions in order to, to grant that. But Anybody seen this type of screen before? Authorize using Twitter? I'm at least seeing heads nod, not as many hands as I would have thought, but you know, the idea that you're going to go and grant access using one of your, your personal or, or online identities, OAuth. You know, OAuth to me is one of these next big transitions that we need to make sure that we are, are clearly understanding that no longer are we only applying permissions locally using you know, a SAM database and NTFS, but rather you're actually starting to look at how all of your different objects are going to exchange either internally or, more importantly, with cloud-based services that you're going to want to grant access to these types of data elements. Or maybe it's a cloud-based service data element that you're going to want to share with, uh, with other applications to be able to interact with. So, OAuth, I think, is going to be the, the, the fundamental building block for, for IT going forward around, around security. Now, the next one, programming languages. So this is an area that's, that's under continual evolution. How many people fancy themselves a developer of some type? OK, fair number of people. Right? We're, there's always that, that interesting blend of the IT pros versus uh, the hardcore devs. So I found this great quote from, I'm from North Carolina, right? So, so I love this bio because I think the guy's pretty much got everything but a Nobel Peace Prize um, in his bio. This was actually at the base of the article. I've never seen any, um, any bio quite like that one before. 
okay, the guy's got some cred. Um, his comment, he was very, very critical about, about how we adapt in, in the age of development. He said, summary in, in what I took away, age is against you, it's hard to pay for experience, twice what you would get for someone that could come in entry level. And, and on a development track, you really need to be able to diversify. One option for diversification is look at how you can move, maybe instead of just you know, straight lines of code check in, look into how you become more of a product architect or uh, the management or design around the development teams. Make sure you've got very deep line of business expertise. I'll, I'll pick on my sister-in-law for this one, right? She, she also works at a, a big chemical company up in Michigan. And one of the things that IT did there that was, was innovative is they put GPS trackers on the top of rail cars. So big tanks of hydrochloric acid. They put a GPS tracking on the top of it, kind of like a, a primitive early version of Find My Friend or Find My iPhone or whatever. Um, by putting that GPS tracker on it, it allowed them to completely optimize their supply chain. They knew when the tanker was arriving, they knew if they needed to clear out, you know, by a certain time and get the other train off the tracks, so that they knew exactly how much time. They were able to completely make their entire line of business more efficient. And I always liked that type of anecdote because the person that implemented that IT system wasn't looking at it from a technology solution, but rather, We've got a problem, and that is that rail cars are stacking up that aren't getting emptied fast enough. We don't know which one is the priority to, to unload, and how can we be more efficient in doing that? So develop a very deep level of experience around your line of business, and if none of that applies and you just want to stay very, very focused, then be sure to stay very current on all the different trends around uh, what technology languages. Sure, sure. Right, so, so for those that couldn't hear, hear Dan Shapiro, he said, you can make the case for the complete opposite. You specialize and be the world's leading expert on that. The, the, the fear there is, yes, you know, now, now we're almost talking about like professional athletes, though. Well, try to find a COBOL program. Right, right, y, Y2K, COBOL guys made, made a ton of money. Yes. And likewise, you know, you can show, you, you know, it, it very well may be the case that experience can, it's just, it's hard to justify for managers to pay twice for experience. But on the other hand, it's also known that good developers are something like 17 times more productive than, than developers that aren't that competent. Sure. So if somebody sure. has proven themselves as a competent developer, you know, in many cases, it actually makes a lot of sense to pay him twice as much. So, you know, there's, I'm not arguing that, the, that our industry isn't gender biased, because it is, and not gender, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's also gender biased. But All right. But it's also, but it's, also, but it's very much age biased, that's definitely the case. And, you know, you can't help but age unless you look at, like, like you do. But, um, <laughs> but, um, wow. but, uh, I still can make a case for many of the inverse points, except perhaps the, the, the understanding of the business needs. That, that definitely always helps. But for everything else? Fair points. Fair points. You know, which, which, is, which is why I provided full citation of my source on, uh, on, on these arguments. But yes, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I certainly won't argue that there are, there are counterpoints um, and there, there is a place for, for people in the, in the opposite direction. Um, this, this did seem like fairly... Fairly sound advice uh, as, a, as a generality, but I do think that there are points to be made in, in, the, in the inverse. So the very last thing that I just wanted to, to, to kind of use in the last, you know, five, 10 minutes is the last thing I, I turned the survey around and I just, I threw it wide open to, to the, the respondents. And I said, first of all, you know, I appreciate people providing this type of input on what they, what they wanted to see. I said, I'm gonna be in front of a room of people that are IT pros just like you and I said, what kinds of things would you want to share with them, and, and how can you help illustrate you know, how you've been able to manage these types of transitions? So this is kind of the, you know, just the, the real easy wrap up. Um, the first one is, is Scott Shipley. Scott is the global director of infrastructure for uh, a medical products firm, uh, Biomet, 
out of Warsaw, Indiana. Uh, Scott got his start by literally installing Citrix to support uh, an SAP deployment, and he went off and he worked for Forsyth in a consulting role and was one of the, one of the primes on the Citrix uh, technology in, in many of the accounts that they, they supported. And family, travel, et cetera, meant that going into a, a corporate IT role may be uh, of, of more interest. And he landed at Biomet. Um, overnight, you know, the, the, this guy went from being, you know, sitting on the floor in the data center to literally the, the corner window office of, you know, leading a, a, a global infrastructure. And so, you know, I asked him one of those things that, that, uh, that worked well for you. A lot of the same stuff that we've already covered. You know, it's changing. Be ready to embrace that and, and handle the turns. Um, he still likes to get his hands dirty. So it doesn't matter that he's, he's managing, you know, over 100 people in, in terms of being a global director. He's still one of the guys that will spend the late nights and, you know, work hard on solving the problem. And the last piece, mentor. Has anybody read the, the Sheryl Sandberg text, Lean In? There's a great chapter in that. that Hand in the back. You, you remember the mentor chapter, right? So she talks about the, the importance of a mentor, but she also talks about how not to try to establish mentorship, right? You don't walk up to, to you know, a celebrity or, or a super senior exec and say, I'd like you to be my mentor and think that that's, you know, going to get you instant, you know, cred points. You really want this to be someone that is, it, it, most mentorships at work start out very informal. It turns out being this, this frequent exchange and, and advice that people can give you. Um, you know, for Scott, he's, he's certainly had several great mentors that, that have helped him. Um, another one, Oliver Parvin over in, in London. Um, he leads the Any Device Design and Engineering team now at, at Cisco IT. This guy was one of the very, very first to really jump into the whole, mobili whole mobility space. Um, he was trying to do, he, and he made all the, the same mistakes that, that many of us would have made. He went out after managing endpoints in mobility, much like you would have done at desktop. So you take the device, we put a VPN client on it, we put encryption on it, and, and that was how we tried to go about managing it. We used um, you know, GoodLink back, way back in the day to be the email and calendar. And he's managed every one of these transitions. Um, you know, he started out literally sitting at a, at a call desk asking people to please migrate from NT4 to Windows 2000. Um, that was when I met him. And, you know, again, you're going to see some common things from, from Ali. Question everything. Don't accept anything as just, you know, status quo or, or that's a given truth. Try to stay passionate and current on what you've got and follow what you're interested in. Chances are if you're interested in it, someone else is interested in it as well. And so don't ever allow what you think is kind of the buzzword of the day to dictate where you invest, but follow your, your interest and your passion. Only two more. Um, success story, Brandy Schmidt. Um, Brandy actually went to school for graphics design and worked on campaigns like uh, An Army of One for, for, the, for the US military. And she went from literally graphics design to where now she's a documentum administrator. And it's been fascinating to, to know Brandy for over the years because here was somebody that used to know Photoshop inside and out to where now she's an expert in migrating physical machines to virtual machines. She had to go from knowing Mac applications to managing Linux-based systems. And so she's like, you know, just be aware of what's out there because here was a chance for someone to just, you know, end in, in kind of a, an IT application support role around graphics applications. Um, and that's given her a chance to, to up-level. And then the very last one, um, it's a little awkward when he's sitting 10 feet away from me. Um, you know, here is a guy that has done it all. He, you know, Dan Brinkman, sitting up here in the first row, the guy's blogged on every topic. He's offered very unbiased um, information about technologies, whether it was a company he was working for or one of the products he directly supported. Overall, just a, a, a great guy. Dan's words of advice for, for folks, don't think that IT is just the, the come to work and go home. There's so much that goes on. This is now pervasive throughout our life. Um, have the home lab, one that I, I kind of tie that one back into Scott Shipley saying, you know, keep your hands dirty. 
having the home lab is, is just one of those things where when you get to go and experiment with something, play, it, you know, play with it on your own time, and don't get religious because one of the things that, that we've seen, and we see it time and time again, is how often are we seeing vendor badges just changing? It's a very, very small industry. So you get here, one day the guy's working for Microsoft, the next day you know, he went from being the Microsoft guy to being the you know, semantic guy, et cetera. Everybody's crossing over all the time, and those relationships are, are things that I think is really what helps sustain a career more than anything. Getting religious about a technology is just as bad when you've, you've got all of this uh, movement within the industry because who knows where that technology is going to evolve or in, under what umbrella it's going to be there. So with that, um, you know, I'll, I'll wrap. I'll certainly turn it over to open to any questions. And you know, I, I'm, I'll, I'll warn you, I think I've got roughly about 20 cards. So if uh, you were one of the people that took the time to, to send me a nice tweet, um, you know, once we wrap, come on up and I'll, I'll hand out everything that I've got. Any questions, thoughts, feedback? Anything that I can do in the last five minutes to earn a five on those yellow sheets in front of you so that I get to come back and do it again? Go for it. Sure, sure. So, so the, 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 the key points I heard, you know, one man, one man IT army in a public library, pace of change and, and especially a bring your own, you know, mentality of, of what you're dealing with with your user community is, is some of those things. Um, you know, I guess my, the, the best advice that I can, I can just explain is there's, there's certain battles that you, can, that you can try and fight and you can try and take the hard line stance. And I have talked to very, very few organizations where complex policies and saying no and trying to wall off the garden that you've, you've created over many years to, to have a, a clean understanding, I just, I'm not seeing that working at, at all. And I think it's, it's futile to, to try to, to just put up a pure resistance path. Um, I think it's really more about trying to make sure that you, you know, manage it the best that you can and make sure that you understand and that you're working collaboratively with your users to establish, listen, this is information that we, we, we do need to protect. Here are some best practices around how we can do that. I understand you're going to do what you, you know, choose to do. Some of those things you can do behind my back, but you know, please make sure that we do it in a collaborative fashion so that we, we do the best we can to move forward together as opposed to you know, a, a hard line IMIT and, and you are the dumb user. I think. Just having an IT department that accepts and, and respects back to the users that we know that you've got the, the, the power and we're not, this isn't a power claim, this is, you know, how can we make sure we do the right thing? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly, exactly. You know, that, that I would refer back to like the identity. There's certain things that you want to just, you know, make it really easy to access. Recognize what the crown jewels are of your organization. I, I hear this all the time from the healthcare community and the federal community. You know, healthcare, federal, I get it. This, this isn't, you know, being nice and being collaborative. This is regulation and compliance that you're held accountable for. Um, you know, and I think that 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 just needs to be hand in hand with the business and with the, uh, with, with the community to, to try and find the right balance. Other questions, thoughts, points of feedback? Basically just, basically just a reiteration that working in a silo um, and, and failing to stay relevant is just one of the biggest threats that we all face today. So 
you know, in, in, enjoy your job. Don't ever allow, allow this to be a downer. What I'm hoping you're able to take away today is that we have managed transitions before. It hasn't always been easy. Some of them have been big. Some of them have been little. Very few of them have come at the pace that we're facing today. But it's a great industry. We've made great careers. Please, you know, continue to enjoy it, invest in yourselves, and thank you guys very much for, for coming to the session today. I